All right, so today we're looking at early industrialization uh, and you know how it developed uh, conditions and structures of the factories, uh, larger consequences for society as a whole. Uh, so the, the first kind of question to look at is um, why did um, the British industrialization happen first? Um, because you have all these areas um, in the world that uh, you had potential for development, um, but there was uh, several different factors that led to England um, uh, really developing uh, first out of everywhere, uh, and then you'll see it spread to continental Europe, the United States, um, and then other parts of the world after. So uh, the reasons for uh, the British to develop at first is that they had a larger access to waterways. And this plays a role because um, in the early factories, you had to have a, a supply chain that could transport goods um, to uh, different areas. Uh, and the roads, inland roads at this point, are not good. Uh, it would have been very slow, plus you couldn't uh, transport the large quantities that you needed to in order to make a, a significant profit. So having a good access to waterways uh, allowed for these early factories not only to transport goods, but the other thing was that it powered uh, the machines um, in many cases, you had water-powered machines before they transferred to steam power and other types of power. Um, so you needed both for power and for transportation of goods. You had, along with the waterways, uh, a network of canals, which also uh, focuses on uh, transportation and the ability for that. Um, you also had a large supply of coal and iron. And these things were important for the development of um, uh, the powering of the machines. Um, and, and so it, short supplies of that are not good access to be able to uh, um, mine coal, for example, which is going to play a huge role in industrialization. Uh, it is certainly going to make it more difficult to advance the way that uh, England was able to. And, and then also they had just a political and uh, a social environment uh, that really allowed for um, merchants and industries, factories and things like that, uh, to develop through bank loans, um, uh, the idea of uh, individualism and capitalism and all those things. So you had these series of things that set them up to be able to be the first to do so. Because they were the first, they also are going to experience the biggest growing pains. Uh, and others like the United States are going to kind of learn from them. Uh, they're going to try to learn from them is probably the best way to say it and try to do things differently and then kind of devolve back into doing exactly what England did uh, at the beginning, which wasn't uh, the best option. Nonetheless, you see England gets a lot of the uh, early kind of crap, if you will, of, of the conditions and poor quality and treatment of its workers that while the poor, you know, uh, poor treatment quality uh, for workers never goes away completely, uh, in, in other areas, um, do adapt and learn from England's kind of first foray into uh, that. So the first factories is what we want to look at here um, to start um, and, and how they developed specifically um, because there was a series of steps that took place um, in order for this to happen um, because it wasn't um, f factory work, the idea of a, a warehouse where everyone goes to work is, was not uh, a concept that was taking place at the beginning here. It was a newly developed thing uh, that happened f because of a series of events. The first uh, is going to be uh, technical innovations, um, that you're going to have new machinery and equipment, which we will look at that. Um, that requires 
space. You just can't uh, contain it in a smaller building um, or in a, a personal home. Um, so we'll come back to look at that development in a minute. And then you have um, what we call the traditional structure of how, um, what you say, I guess, early uh, individual manufacturing uh, happened. So in uh, most places in the world pre-industrialization, you had uh, farming, which was the number one um, thing that people did. Uh, people had family farms. There were some larger farms as well that were more considered commercial farms. But the reality is, is that um, uh, people farmed for their livelihood. Uh, you do have some cities and there were other jobs, but farming was uh, by far the dominant force. And then what went with this is artisans. And artisans uh, were skilled um, craftsmen. So you would have an artisan who uh, was a good table maker or an artisan that know, did furniture as a more broad sense of it, an artisan who did, who was, uh, who did shoes. And this was a craft that uh, took years of learning and you tended to have um, apprenticeships um, where they would take someone on that was somewhat like an indentured servant. Um, so sorry, that was my dog that found a squeaky toy, of course, right at the beginning of the lecture. So you had uh, apprenticeships that were um, somewhat like indentured servants in the sense that you had to work for them for a number of years and you had to actually get approval in order to become like a master craftsman yourself and then eventually ideally have your own store. And so these kind of work together, right? Farming was the production of food and, and, and to survive. And then you would go, uh, this went in tandem with the merchants who uh, purchased from the artisans, right? So they would buy from the artisans uh, for some of their skilled labor. And then the farmers would go to the merchants to buy the goods, the local goods that they wanted. Um, the thing with this system is that, of course, artisans were more expensive, but they were the only option initially anyway. So that's what you had, but we'll see that they end up being more expensive than what the factories can produce with unskilled labor. Um, you do have a decrease uh, in quality of craftsmanship, but the trade-off is that it's cheaper and artisans then are more expensive in that process. So this is the traditional structure that happened. Now what starts to happen is that within farming, um, you have a decline in um, viability uh, with farming. And what this means is that, and, and specifically with family farms, um, so that people who had long relied on uh, sustainability and production through farming found that the economy the value of their product for their, their food was uh, not supporting them in the way that it used to do. Um, and because of this, um, it created problems with um, not enough money. And uh, this led to the merchants looking to uh, adapt a new system uh, that could take advantage of that called the putting out system. And the putting out system was a, a, in some ways an attempt to circumvent um, the artisans. So the merchants uh, would provide materials and instructions on step-by-step -step instructions on how to make a particular item. Uh, for example, one of the earliest were shoes. And then usually uh, the farmer's wife um, that uh, with a farming family that was struggling to um, make uh, ends uh, to meet uh, enough production to survive, um, that then she would go pick up the materials and then take it back home. There, 
um, in spare time, you know, in between uh, taking care of the household chores and farming and the kids, um, they would create the product, in this case, if we're looking at the, you know, shoes. Uh, the children could also help with uh, shoelaces and things like that. And then they would return the finalized product to the merchants. And then um, the merchants would sell it uh, for less than what it would have it would cost them uh, if they bought it uh, from an artisan. And this way, the uh, farmers got money, right? And uh, merchants sold at cheaper price. And most people um, didn't care about the lesser quality that it was. Um, and, and so this was a, a, like peace, this is like early piecework essentially. Uh, so, and the putting out system being the way that it was put out, the work was put out to someone. Um, and this was a way for the farmers also, right, to supplement their income. This was done with shoes and early textiles uh, are some of the earliest. Early textiles was something that people were already familiar with. Um, you had the um, personal spinning wheel that was at the home that could weave um, uh, thread and then you could use that with the loom to make cloth. Um, and so one of the things that they often did was spin thread or uh, have a loom which then they could like weave cloth. And so all of that uh, were things that were kind of familiar jobs for women but it also provided a supplemental income in the process. And so that was one of the early steps. What changes uh, from here is that you have um, new technology um, that develops that is going to change how the putting out system uh, can function and move and shift to actual factories instead. So you had, um, the first was the, um, the spinning wheel and that was definitely a small uh, product that would, could be at home that an individual could do. Um, but one of the things that the putting out system ha had as an issue was constant shortage. Um, it couldn't keep up with the demand. And so people were looking to create new technology that they could use, uh, that could, they could produce more cotton for people because one of the things that was beneficial about that is you could make uh, clothing that was uh, not as coarse as some of the more traditional style of clothing. Um, and with the putting out system, it was cheaper than it had ever been before. And so people were interested in it. And so it was seen as a potential profit. So one of the first uh, developments was called the cotton spinning jenny. Uh, and this was still done, could be um, maintained and controlled by one person. It was larger and it does get larger as time goes on. However, there was still some ability to have it at home or a small um, building where uh, an individual would go to that building, a single person um, could, could go and do the putting out system. It was inexpensive, um, it, but it's that first step and change um, towards the factories. The next one that, took, uh, that was developed was uh, called the water frame. And this one used, as the name suggests, water power, um, and also was uh, much larger. It had the capacity to uh, be created with several hundred spindles um, that could be running uh, at a time. The spindles are what the thread went on, uh, and then, and then um, water powered. Um, and so this requires specialized buildings to go to. And uh, people who owned, the, the average person 
um, like the farmer and his wife and family um, could not uh, purchase this at all. So it was too expensive, which meant it had to go to owners, businessmen that were um, looking to make a larger profit. And so they started filling large where what would be considered they weren't really called warehouses back then but warehouses or buildings with the um either well some were the cotton spinning jennies and water frames so initially they kind of had half and half and because the water frame uh spinning uh, machine was very expensive so they uh, uh would slowly transition to it and then this then naturally moves to um, uh, cementing by uh, the 1790s, you have a full shift to a factory setting, which means that uh, someone is no longer doing it from their home, but they're going to work uh, for someone else in a, in a separate building. Um, and so that is the beginning of uh, the factory uh, system uh, and it's... I'll, we'll look at um, there were there were a couple other developments you're gonna have a steam-powered one that emerges later um, let's look at uh, some of the early systems so this one here is the spinning wheel and the idea with the spinning wheel, of course, is that this, this could fit in the house. And these had been around uh, for a very long time. So it was familiar. It also was largely, it was always women uh, who did this type of work, which is gonna be important uh, for especially the US um, but even in, in other areas as well, when you move into textile work in factories, that there was some apprehension for men participating in this type of labor because it was definitely connected to the domestic sphere and the role that women played in that. Um, this was slow, though. Uh, you were not going to um, no mass producing here, right? So it worked for, as we talked about, uh, the putting out system but it's not gonna it wouldn't be effective with uh, the factory at all um, the next one is the cotton spinning Jenny and this is a larger version um, they did have a slightly smaller version but you can see here I mean this this is is a much much larger one the average person's home is not going to be able to fit uh, this in their house um, but you can also see with this uh, that it's still uh, one person. I can't really see that very well here. One person and it's one in a room. So again, you still have um, the fact that an individual could potentially afford to purchase this, uh, store it in uh, a building, and continue the putting out system with the cotton spinning jenny. However, when you move on to some of the other ones, this is the water frame. Now, it's not as, this it cut off just the, the end here with that uh, format, formatting, but while it's not as long as the cotton spinning Jenny, um, it, it was much taller um, and was powered by water. So you had to have a water source and it was super expensive. So this is the end of uh, the putting out system with this technology. And, and, and the reason for that is that this provided a way to uh, more quickly produce cotton and textiles. And so you could um, not only make it cheaper, but sell it for cheaper as well. And the importance with that, of course, is then that this was seen as the factory model for mass production and being able to make a profit and it benefited people and they bought more because it was cheaper to do so. Um, so here's this one is just kind of shows you some of the different ones. You have the spinning mule um, that that develops and then the power loom is one of the larger ones. The cotton gin uh, was a product that helped 
clean the cotton uh, and at a much, much faster rate than the old traditional hand method. Um, and this also kick-started in the development of, of all of these uh, different um, wheels and spinning frames because ultimately um, if you can't produce enough clean cotton, raw cotton, then it doesn't matter how fast you're, you're spinning the thread or weaving the, the cloth if the raw material isn't there. And the cotton gin was the catalyst for that. So the cotton gin was very important as well, um, uh, just as the uh, being able to have a much more mass produced raw material to be able then to produce all of this stuff. So those are the different types of um, uh, machinery that developed in creating those early, uh, the shift to early factory. Now what I want to look at next is, um, some of the early consequences that developed, um, uh, because of this shift and change to this style of labor. Um, and, and there's several different things in society in um, production. Get this up here. So with early consequences, um, there are some that were positive, right? There's going to be a lot of negative stuff, um, but there were positive things that took place in, and changes that it did for society. Uh, and there's my dog finding the squeak toy again. Um, <laughs> she's like a toddler that doesn't ever stop. Uh, so sorry about that. So the early consequences, the positive ones that we're going to look at first is that, uh, because of an increase in cotton production, um, and, um, the fine end products, the textile products and stuff, you end up with cheaper prices so that more people were able to afford even the poor, um, access to clothes, uh, being able to have better clothes, uh, really, and, and more clothes as options, uh, wages for weavers. Uh, was actually pretty high in the early periods of, of industrialization until basically um, the 1800s because there was a demand for it and because it was still in that early period that you don't have the full-fledged factories. By the 1800s, why this date is because then you have the full-fledged um, factories. And once you have that, you're going to have a fundamental shift in how working is done um, and that's going to change things. You also have now, um, it, ha it does raise, uh, it raised the average standard of living, both for um, the factory workers in terms of, of well, not, not for the workers individually, but as uh, in any country that um, shifted to industrialization with England first, but then others as well. Um, you have the overall standard of living for the country, uh, goes up. And that's in part because of, of, of cheaper goods and access to goods that didn't exist before. However, individual factory workers standard of living, um, is not going to be great. Um, there was mixed reaction to, and we're, we'll look at those conditions in just a minute. There's mixed reaction to this whole process. Um, early on, uh, most people were not interested um, in working for the factories. They actually had trouble um, finding workers uh, for the factories. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, one was of course that because it was uh, textile work, um, this was, as I mentioned, seen as women's work and they largely were, uh, looking for men initially to, uh, work in the factories. Uh, they are going to shift to several different things. Um, uh, one is going to be hiring women to work and then later children. And we'll, we'll look at all of that in a minute. The other thing was that, um, it was, uh, often seen, it got early on, it got a very negative connotation attached to, 
um, the workplace, I suppose, um, because the early um, factories were set up in what were very similar to English poorhouses. Um, English poorhouses were really um, horrible places. People who were um, destitute and had absolutely no other option would go to these. Um, and they were given food uh, and lodging, um, but only for hard labor. And uh, they were often dirty. Let's put that for there and unsafe so the fact that you had these early factories that uh, looked a lot like the poor houses um, gave it a very negative image that people weren't really interested in working there um, and then the fact also was that some early factories ended up using prison labor uh, for their factories because um, they couldn't get enough workers so if you have um, this sense that it's a poor house which had a really bad reputation. Um, it's women's work and the men don't want to work there and then early factories use prison labor. You're not going to be like, yeah, that sounds like a job I want to do. Uh, and and they, the reality was is that the early factories were dark, um, they were dirty, um, and they were unsafe. So all the things that the poor houses were, uh, they, they were called names like uh, a satanic mills and uh, pits of hell which also was used for the mines um, so it, it, it just you had this horrible horrible connotation uh, attached to it um, at the same time what is, is interesting is that you also had those that uh, celebrated you had we'll say mixed reaction uh, because there, there were two kind of things that took place uh, one was a, a celebration of factories uh, as progress and seen as a sign of, of um, a, a quality improvement within the society, right? They were moving forward. And then you had those that lamented um, the destruction of um, rural society, basically because uh, one of the consequences of factory work was, and the development and increase in factories is that you had an increase of population um, that moved from the country uh, to uh, cities. And this was happening um, in part because of economic issues. You also had changes in how some of the landlords and farming was taking place. Um, and also those that then were just looking for work. Um, and what this created was called the pastoral movement, um, which uh, idealized um, farming and, and rural life to the point of it being uh, not realistic. Uh, it was seen, I mean, because farming was hard work. It's, it's not like somehow farming was easy and, and factory work was hard. They're very different types of labor and that's gonna be one of the struggles that people have um, with the working conditions is that significant change in how you work. Um, but, but farming was hard work too, but the pastoral movement, uh, idealized it as this idyllic lifestyle that was just a utopia, uh, that, that, uh, society had foregone. And in England, you had poets and, and others that wrote, uh, uh poems about the idealized sense of what uh, pastoral life was and how we are losing ourselves by, um, moving into cities and factory towns. You had artists that idealized it. We'll look at a picture in just a minute. At the same time though, you had others that celebrated the factory, that celebrated the smokestacks 
in towns that that was a sign of progress. This should be something that was looked on as a good thing, not something that's negative. And the best way to show that is to looking at these two contrasting images um, from this, this time period. So this first one um, here, this, this drawing, and again, it just cuts off a little bit, it's the same thing. This, uh, you know, I think to many people today, if they looked at this, you're looking at, at pollution, it's dark. This was the cult. This was this was the the image. There is kind of dreary. You have all of these factories, and there was one other here. Where the bridge just goes there, so we just get cut off on the on a, a, the s edge here. But right, there's no nature um, at all in this factory town, and this is a factory town with uh, several smokestacks showcased right and uh, the the smoke billowing up um, it's dreary at least so this is my impression of the image right is that it creates this kind of dreary look uh, maybe even dirty because of the smokestacks and stuff but this picture was was actually uh, this was not what it was uh, meant to show it was actually meant to uh, celebrate progress. And there were those that, that celebrated that, that looked at this and saw this as a good thing, right? That this was an indication of, if you saw this, if you went into a town of progress and wealth, and it was something to be celebrated, right? So there were plenty of people who saw that as as a part of that and this this painting the um, specifically was meant to celebrate the success of factories in progress and then you have the pastoral ideal which was also done around the same time uh, and again it was both in writing and um, paintings artists did it quite a bit which created this idyllic uh, life that uh, that farming, rural uh, areas, that's what they, these were the two themes that were shown as this super positive uh, utopian lifestyle. And that this was what had been lost because of factories. Um, so again, very mixed opposing viewpoints um, that took place in reaction to the rise of factories. And there were definitely both not just owners of factories that celebrated, there were other people that did as well. Um, and, then, and then others who said, you know, look at the greenery, and there was always an emphasis on, on nature. Um, nature was a huge aspect of that. And then you've got the family, uh, you know, hanging out, uh, and it, it, what's interesting was with the pastoral representations, they almost never show the families like doing hard work. <laughs> They're like hanging out and lounging and just enjoying the scenery and nature and, and uh, that part of it. Um, so that uh, is the, the different mixed reactions with it again, the pastoral movement or as a celebration of, of progress. Um, so what I want to look at now is, is uh, uh, changes to um, the, the way that people worked, the structure of work within the factory, um, and uh, some of the things that happened with that. So the factory conditions and work style. Part of uh, how they ended up getting the negative reputation and um, the the term satanic mills uh, had to do with, of course, um, workers and the conditions and structure. Some of it was more just adapting to a different style of work that was difficult for people. And then, of course, there were really bad conditions as well. Um, so one, one of the things is that for most people, the hours of work significantly increased. Um, this was tied also to super structured work. Um, if you were on the farm, right, you could set your own, your own hours. And 
there were definitely uh, periods of insane work with harvest and um, season, seasonal uh, craziness, if you will. Um, but at the same time, you were still at your home. You could uh, go in for lunch, you could take a break, you did more work when you needed to. Um, and now you had this uh, constant structured work and longer hours every day that was never ending. Um, and so it was a combination both of a different style of work and then just uh, uh, constant rather than ups and downs within that. They also, a lot of the early factories relied on a bell um, to signal the time. Uh, and this uh, would go off uh, a bell or buzzer, which would probably even be worse. Uh, and it, it did sound like it drove some people crazy. Um, it would be for starting time, uh, breaks, lunch, and end time. And uh, this idea of, of, of living uh, your life dictated by this bell or buzzer um, was uh, difficult for people. It's interesting because there's actually been comparisons to the idea of the bell uh, to high schools and the high schools that use bells that um, it was preparing people for factory work and structured time and schedule and, and uh, responding to the bell. So the bell indicates when class starts, the bell indicates when class ends. Uh, your transition time, lunch, all of that type of thing. Uh, and so then it gets you into that routine for when you transfer to factory way back in the day, right? That that's, uh, uh, there's been uh, things written about that when high schools first started developing that um, it was intended, it was, it was done intentionally to prepare people for that. Uh, but, but it was that, that idea was very different. People hadn't lived like that. That had not been a type of, of labor um, that people had to adjust to. Um, the, there were no uh, safety um, things, uh, uh, what policies in place at all. Um, and of course, there was no uh, workers compensation. If you got injured, um, you were just out of luck and out of a job. Um, so that was unfortunate. And, and if we'll, we'll look at some pictures of early mills, the, uh, the machines were dangerous. So it's not just that, well, you know, you, if you're stupid, really stupid, you might hurt yourself or slip or something. No, these machines that they were working on were very dangerous and, uh, largely by poor people that there were people that, that didn't have shoes that were working with this machinery that could, could, if you got your hand got caught in it or your foot or anything, you could lose limbs. And there were things you had to change like the spindles. Um, and uh, that was, at first wasn't a dangerous job, but as it evolved with the machinery, it became a dangerous job. And you had to quickly, they didn't want to stop the machine. So you had to change it quickly in between this like spike pin coming down, um, which could stab you in the hand if you weren't fast enough. Um, uh, amongst other uh, serious safety things that would never fly today. And that's later in history, um, if you especially look at the U.S., but you, other places around the world as well. Um, you're going to have unions develop and protests and other things to try to get these, these issues of long working hours, bad pay, uh, unsafe conditions, um, all of that being addressed but that takes time and there's no rules right now like right? that's that's key with it right this is brand new there are no rules for what owners can do they can do whatever they want and it definitely did not favor the worker um, women in england were often uh, sexually assaulted uh, um, by the manager um, and essentially threatened in order to keep their job uh, to either whether that was uh, uh, you know touching or harassment or or rape um, that was something that was uh, common in the factories in England and actually gets brought up later when we look at um, the transition in the US that was something that specifically is is uh, addressed because of that concern and 
fear uh, of that. You also had, um, of course, poor pay. Um, and then this coincided with um, the uh, work in the mines, the factory work and um, the mines. Uh, were often seen as kind of um, connected because, I mean, they were. Coal mining um, was uh, something that was always was around before, but it increased with the demand of factories and uh, the use uh, with the change in technology to power the machines with coal. Um, the coal factories uh, usually were uh, family units and children uh, were used uh, for the small tunnels. So a lot of the um, tunnels um, with the, uh, going in to, to get the coal were too small for adults. And so children would be sent down and with, they could be within these uh, tunnels where they were dark, dirty, and unsafe uh, for most of the day where they didn't see the sunlight and of course it was hard labor. This also translated um, into uh, child labor in the factories as well. So the uh, coal mining uh, tended to be family units. And again, the children, are the, the conditions, we'll look at some images, are still horrible. Um, but the child labor in factories, because they did run into that problem of not having enough people to uh, initially, again, this is in the earlier years, to uh, work in the factories, uh, they used orphans in England, and this will be also something that other uh, countries learn and don't do uh, because it gets such a horrible reaction to it long term. Children uh, as young as uh, five to six would be put to work um, in the factories. They were basically a, uh, what would be considered adopted by the factory owner and they lived in uh, factory dormitories which was basically uh, a room off to the side of the factory floor they were locked in at night and they were given um, food right and i suppose lodging if you will but uh, for work. They were not paid in any other way. And most places uh, required at least 14 years of labor to be set free. So for all intents and purposes and stuff that way, they were uh, uh, slaves um, or indentured servants uh, would be the better, I think. Slaves, you don't have any point of freedom. so. Um, th this, this made them indentured servants and, and horrible conditions. Um, you had harsh physical punishment for not working uh, fast enough, hard enough. Um, it, was, it was really horrible conditions. Um, and this is going to lead to... Um, protest uh, and changes in the laws and we'll say reform here um, as this continued and there were a couple different things without we'll come back to that we'll look at that in just a second I want to show the um, images first so you have here um, here's some pictures of, of children in the mills and this is the textile these are the spindles I was talking about that had to be manually replaced so you have the uh, orphans and then the uh, manager or owner of the mill that was responsible for making sure they worked. Here's one of uh, an, a drawing of the early factories. Uh, and this is why I'm mentioning that they had a slow transition between different types early on um, that they would slowly replace uh, in the more expensive and larger um, 
machines. Here's another one that shows uh, not only the spindles, but then weaving. The, uh, this is a good one as far as just showing the, um, how many machines and how much was being produced in these factories. Um, these ones are images of, of children in the coal mines. Here you had, this was for light so that they could see and you can see it's dirty, uh, hard, hard work. Here's another image of the children that were working in the coal mines. Uh, and then this one is a good example of these tunnels, right? So. Um, you would have this cart that had the coal and then you had the chain that went got tied around the waist and um, often again children were used for this because the tunnels were too small for adults. One person would help pull it up then you'd have others that would help push and this is what you did all day in the dark in these tiny tunnels that did collapse um, and and you only came out long enough to bring the coal out and then you went back into the tunnel to bring more coal. Um, so it was this this horrid, oh, this is where you get the pits of hell um, described. So with reform, uh, because of the conditions, specifically the earliest reform wasn't for adult um, hours and safety conditions, but specifically reform for um, the children. There were uh, uh, several that protested and uh, addressed the um, problems with uh, what they saw of the forced labor that they had to do and, and the conditions and treatments, uh, uh, treatment of the children. One of the most uh, famous um, uh, protests or responses was Elizabeth uh, Barrett Browning who wrote the poem The Cry of the Children um, to bring to light the horrible conditions of, of these child laborers in England. Um, so I wanted to take a look at that. I had you guys look at this um, but I want to uh, take a quick look at um, the, some of the key points and stuff with it. Uh, so you have here um, the first part, right? Do you hear the children weeping? Oh, my brothers, ere the sorrow comes with years. They are leaning their head, young heads against their mothers, and that cannot stop their tears. The young lambs are bleeding in the meadows. The young birds are chirping in the nest. The young fawns are playing with the shadows. The young flowers are blowing towards the west. But the young, um, young children, oh, my brothers, they are weeping bitterly. So this first part here, this is right, this is all um, what the young should be doing, right? You have all these different animals and, um, or, uh, or in flowers, I suppose. This is what the young should be doing, but the young children, right, they are crying or weeping. Right, they are weeping in the playtime of others in the country of the free. Right, and this, so then this is critiquing that uh, the country and uh, wealthy are um, playing, right, um, while the children weep. And she's going to be critical of this idea that. Um, the greatness of the country is on the backs uh, and deaths of these children. Um, and so then, rise. do you question the young children in sorrow why their tears are falling? Um, the old man, so then it goes into the opposite, right? The first was the young. Then it goes into um, that the old have reason um, for um, crying or sorrow but the young should not. Right, and you see that by that same list of the young, right? The old man may weep for his tomorrow, which is lost and long ago. The old tree is leafless in the forest. The old year is ending in the frost. 
Um, but the young, young children, oh my brothers, do you ask them why they stand, weeping sore before the bo bosoms of their mothers in our happy fatherland? And again, contrasting it again to the country. Um, so that, right, England is prosperous and happy at the price of children's souls. Um, so it, she is very critical of uh, England and the country and the circumstance that they're in because of the children's labor. The next stanza, you have um, a description of the children, right? They look up with their pale and sunken faces and their looks are sad to see. Um, your old earth they say is very dreary our young feet they say are very weak a few paces have we taken yet are weary our grave rest is very far to seek uh and so this idea of the children being tired and worn down um and and then um that they die um oh so this this next one um, they say, ask the old why they weep and not the children, for the outside earth is cold, and we young ones stand without in our bewildering, and the graves are for the old. So this is, this is not, um, so this goes back and forth between essentially the uh, speaker or author of the poem, right, although not necessarily Elizabeth Barrett Browning, but right, so there's someone talking to the children, and um, that, that's the person talking to the children. And then they're going to respond to that person that's saying, you know, why, ask the old why they weep, not the children, right? Uh, and we young ones standing without our building and the graves are for the old. And so then the children respond here, true say the children, it may happen that we die before our time. And then they give an example. Little Alice died last year, her grave is shaped like a snowball in the rhyme. We looked into the pit, prepared to take her, was no room for any work in the close clay. From the sleep wherein she lieth, none will wake her, crying, Get up, little Alice, it is day. If you listen by that grave and sun and shower with your ear down, little Alice never cries. Could we see her face, be sure we would should not know her, for the smile has time for growing in her eyes, and merry go her moments, lulled and stilled in the shroud by the kirk chime. It is good when it happens, say the children, that we die before our time. So here is the idea that death is where happiness happens. That little Alice was smiling uh, because she doesn't have to work in death. Right, and this is meant to showcase just the horrid conditions uh, of that um and that they're longing for the death so then the the person talking to the kids alas the wretched children they are seeking death and life as best to have that's the person shocked that the kids want death um and then the 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 person talking to them suggests go uh to nature right here's that um that pastoral there's gonna be in quotations there that pastoral idea well you just need to get out um, right, go out children from the mine and from the city, sing out children as little thrushes do, pluck your handfuls of the meadow cowslips pretty, which is flower, laugh aloud and feel the fingers through, right, so go out to the nature, that's how you'll be happy, for oh, say the children, we are weary and we cannot run or leap, if we cared for any meadows, it were, were merely to drop down in them and sleep, our knees tremble sorely in the stooping, we fall upon our faces trying to go, and underneath our heavy eyelids drooping, the reddest flower would look as pale as, as snow. For all day we drag our burden tiring through the cold, dark underground, or all day we drive the wheel of iron in factories round and round. So constant labor, right, means uh, no time to play. Not only no time or ability, to play. For all the day the wheels are droning, turning, their wind comes in our faces till our hearts turn, our heads with pulses burning, and the walls turn in their places. 
turns the sky and, and, and the high window blank and wheeling, turns the long light that droppeth down the wall, turns the black flies that crawl along the ceiling, all are turning all the day and we with all. It's this all the all and all day the iron wheels are droning. And sometimes we could pray, O oh, ye wheels breaking out in a mad moaning, stop, be silent for the day. So it's that a constant uh, uh, noise and work again everything's turning everything's always moving loud noises in the factory um and so it, it is it's loud noises but then it's just, again the constant motion of of their work right it's never ending Then the author pleads to let the children realize God has more in life for them, right? Saying, you know, we will hopefully you can realize God has uh, more in life for you. Um, uh, you know, you please let God prove, like let them prove their inward souls against the notion that they live in you or under you, O wheels. Uh, and the children's souls, which God is calling sunward, spin on blindly in the dark. Now tell the poor young children, O oh my brothers, to look up to him and pray. So the blessed one who blesseth all the others will bless them another day. Right? And he continues that here. Then here's the kids answering. Who is God that he should hear us while the rushing of the iron wheels is stirred? So the idea is God can't hear them. And this is the kids' response because it's so loud. Pass, uh, when we sob aloud, the human creatures near us pass by hearing not or answer not a word, and we hear not for the wheels and their resounding, so no one can hear. Strangers speaking at the door. It is likely God with angels singing round him hears our weeping anymore. So they're skeptical. They, they don't believe. God can hear them. And then they go further than that. Two words indeed of praying we remember, and at midnight's hour of harm, our Father, looking upward in the chamber, we say softly for a charm. We know no other words except our Father, and we think that in some pause of angels' songs, God may pluck them with the silent sweet to gather and hold both within his right hand, which is strong. Um, and, and so the plan, right? God will hear them. And they say, no, say the children weeping faster. He is speechless as a stone. And they tell us of his image is the master who commands us to working on. So then they, the children, so again, it goes into this idea of, oh, well, if you say our father and there'll be this charm and hopefully at least God will respond and they'll feel that connection. They say, no, God's image is to master and master is to the person making them work and treating them bad. Right, so then it's this idea that even God isn't a comfort. Go to, say the children up in heaven, dark wheel like turning clouds are, we, are all we find. Do not mock us, grief has made us unbelieving. We look up for God, but tears have made us blind, right? So it's that it's either a negative image or they don't believe because of, of how they're treated, because of grief, uh, because of the hard labor, right? Um, and then this is the author again, right? Say, do you hear the children weeping and disapproving, O oh, my brothers, what you preach? For God's possible is taught by his world's loving and the children doubt of each. So then it's saying, right, God is taught and shown through the world loving people, which really just means, you know, loving people. That, right, God's word is shown through love is what that's connected to. And the children doubt of that. And well may the children weep before you. They are weary ere they run. They have never seen the sunshine nor the glory which is brighter than the sun. They know the grief of man without its wisdom. They sink in despair without its calm. Our slaves without the liberty and Christendom are martyrs by the pang without the palm. Are worn as if with age, yet unretrievingly, no dear remembrance keep. Our orphans of earthly love and heavenly, let them weep, let them weep. So this is just all, all the bad conditions. 
the contradictions as well. And then this, the final, like, what's wrong with society thing. They, they look up with their pale and sunken faces and their look is dread to see, for they think you see their, an their angels in their places with eyes meant for deity. How long they say, here's the call to England. And this is what Elizabeth Barrett Browning was then trying to, to her, summing up. How long they say, how long, O cruel nation, will you stand to move the world on a child's heart? Stifled down with a mailed heel its palpitation and tread onward to your throne amid the mart. Our blood splashes upward, O oh, our tyrants, and your purple shoes your path. But the child sob curseth, curseth deeper in the silence than the strong man in his wrath. So it's how long, England, are you going to stand on the death of children and their sorrow and their weariness for your, um, your wealth and power? Um, so this, this poem is, is, is one, it, it was very powerful in showcasing the horrible conditions of the children um, and, and just that what it had done to the kids, as well as saying, why are we doing this and how long are we willing to, to have success and progress on the back of children? Now, the other one that I had you look at was Rules of a Berlin Factory, when we're talking about the different conditions and work structure. Um, this was a list of rules that was distributed to the employees. Um, and it just gives you a sense. We won't spend as much time on this one. It's a little more straightforward, the poem, right? It's kind of how you, you know, uh, read poems, it, knowing how to read it makes it easier to understand. And I, I'm, I'm guessing that, that if, if there was any one document that people had more trouble with, it was the cry of the children than the rules. Um, but right, it begins early in the morning, 6 a.m., and then it talks about the, the bells and the doorkeeper locks the door punctually at 6 a.m. Uh, and uh, locks the door, right? You get locked in. Um, the deduction from the wage shall be entered in the wage book of the gatekeeper whose duty for tardiness. So you, you lose wages for being late, right? Um, it also talks about uh, the bell. Uh, there's so many with the bell of, of just how the bell structures and everything, everything that they do. Um, no workman, whether employed by time or peace, may leave before the end of the working day without having first received permission. Right. So again, that lack of being able to come and go, you don't have the freedom for that. Repeated irregular arrival at work shall be dismissal. Um, all conversations with fellow workers is prohibited. This was a common thing that they did for a while, uh, which was that you weren't allowed to talk to anyone. So not only were you then structured around the bell and this hard labor and uh, all of these penalties for little nitpicky things, but then you weren't even supposed to talk to other people. And you had to go to the overseer if you had questions. Um, but I mean, this is, this is crazy. There's no, no talking, no idleness, no anything, right? You should be constantly working. You need to be constantly on time. You can't leave without specific permission. You have to clean your space when you're done. Um, you, as soon as you finish the piecework, every workman must hand it over at once to his foreman to receive a fresh piece of work. Right, it's that constant working. It, uh, it goes without saying that all overseers and officials of the firm shall be obeyed without question. Uh, disobedience will be punished by dismissal. Lots of ways to get fired here. Immediate dismissal shall also be the fate of anyone found drunk, which that's not unreasonable for that one. <laughs> but there's a lot of other ways to get dismissed that are silly too. Um, untrue allegations against superiors or officials of the concern shall lead to stern reprimand. This was definitely about those sexual allegations um, and then uh, abuse, uh, the physical punishment. Um, and so this is like a threat, basically. Like, don't 
don't uh, don't think that your uh, your um, accusations against the overseers and foreman is going to be taken seriously. You're more likely to get penalized for making those, um, and that was definitely a reaction to those type of things. Um, and then of course, report uh, uh, rat uh, every everyone else out, rat your workers out for dishonesty or embezzlement. Um, those are the, the other one is is more. Uh, the advance is granted to older workers um, and stuff that way. So again, this one is just a good example of, of some of the crazy uh, rules as well as, as how many talk about the bell and how that shapes, uh, you know, everything is centered around the bell and, and, and time and the importance of time. You have no freedom within this factory system. And it was a harsh transition in reality for those who had to, who shift to that. Um, okay, so those were the two documents I want to make sure we looked at since I was having you read those. Um, as far as protest and reform, because of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's A Cry of the Children, um, along with some other protests that, protests that, that uh, uh, took place after, you had the Factory Act of 1833. Uh, so it took a while for significant change uh, for children. Um, and this limited the workday for kids. And it went, uh, anyone who was uh, nine to uh, 13 years old, um, they could only work eight hours a day. Younger kids could not work. There were, um, of course, some exceptions to that uh, within family businesses and stuff, but with it was meant to be under the factory. Children under nine now had to go to elementary school. So there were some positive changes to protect kids, minimal, um, but they were still there. Uh, but it, it took, what, 30 years to, to, <laughs> to get to that point. And in the meantime, you had a lot of abuse within the system. Now, there, because of factory development, because of this change in society, you had other new technology that fundamentally changed the structure of the world. Um, and one of those, well, let's look at, one of this has to do with transportation. Actually, all of it has to do um, with uh, transportation that we're going to be looking at. There are, there are some other things, but transportation was a huge part of it. And it had to do, of course, with the question of shipping goods. And, and how to be able to get goods um, more effectively and quicker. Um, ways that had been done before, you had inland roads, um, and then you had by sea. Um, and and, and these, this was, of course, limited uh, in location, and inland roads was just slow and uh, minimal for what you could do. When canals began to be built, that provided some additional opportunities. And then steamboats opened up more areas to ship goods. And then you also had um, the uh, railroads, which are going to be a massive change. So steamboats, canals, um, were important in changes. Um, but, uh, the, we'll see the, the railroads were the most significant, but part of that, that gets to that has to do with steam engines. Steam engine development happened, um, in, in part, um, a, as a way to look at, um, saving on uh, how much they were burning through of various resources. In England, you had issues with iron production that was decreasing at the time. And uh, part of the reason for that had to do with the fact that in order to produce it, they ended up depleting uh, forests, uh, a lot of them actually. Uh, and you were they were running out of wood, so it was it was you know the I think we saw with that that image that was seen as an idea of progress. There's no sense of um, uh, any type of uh, protection of the earth or or the idea of pollution or deforestation outside of oh crap we have no wood to produce this anymore. So coal 
uh, uh, was looked to more as an option. Now, coal wasn't new. Um, it was first used as a source um, to heat the home in the Middle Ages in, in, in the area. Um, so it was, um, like I said, something that was already around, but it began to be more of a focus um, because coal then is used uh, to power the machines and new technology. So what happens is that, well, one of the problems is that you can still uh, uh, literally burn through coal pretty quickly. Um, and it's a lot to um, be able to produce it and have it ready. So the significance of this steam engine is that um, it, it saved a lot of waste um, of, of the energy of coal and, and cut down the amount of use. Steam engines ended up replacing a lot of coal function, although coal was still being used for a lot. Um, and you end up having it used for cotton mills, not cotton, cotton mills. Uh, flour mills and breweries were some of the earliest um, uh, for factories uh, that used steam-powered engines for their machines. As I mentioned, though, of course, the most influential was railroads. Railroads changed the dynamic for transportation and specifically steam engines, once those get developed in, in um, trains, allows for faster travel and cheaper cost. This is going to um, uh, have a lot of um, significance in society. So that, let's look at just some of the things that are important uh, for what the railroads do. One, it allows for cheaper goods because of transportation and the ability to go further. Um, inland access to factories means that factories can now be built anywhere. Prior to this, factories had to be connected to a waterway because you're transporting large goods. Um, and that meant that, the, and, and then some of the machines were water powered as well. Now with, with steam engines, not only do you not rely on water sources for your machines, but you also can now have uh, be out wherever for your factory and use the, um, the trains to, to send your goods. Um, and so that's going to eventually create more cities and development in different areas that otherwise were not uh, reasonable for that. Travel, uh, more and more people begin to travel as, as railroads uh, and trains become a significant thing where they can actually pull passenger cars. Uh, people are able to go further distances. Um, not only faster, but just go farther than they had before. Um, it, this does shift uh, uh, mostly to fully uh, factory-based systems over artisans. Because now um, some of those issues with artisans that still were in, in more remote areas is, is unnecessary. City development, right? I already said expansion of, of population growth in new areas because people begin to move to regions that the railroads take people. Um, you also have uh, new industries and companies that uh, get built um, because of the railroads, right? Eventually that's gonna be steel, um, maintenance, things like that. And there, there's, there's some others too, but that, that's a good list as far as just to give you an idea of very quickly popping up some of the lists of things that took place. Uh, it was massive and changing kind of the role of travel, of, of jobs, of factories, of, of goods. Also, I mean, I mentioned good, cheaper goods, but also you get not only nationwide goods, 
but worldwide goods. Now you can actually transport goods to other countries in Europe, right? The U.S. it's going to be more nationwide because there's still this continent that's in sea that's in between continents. But in Europe, you now can have goods transported between continents, and so you get more nationwide products, um, which was something that hadn't ever been around before. Um, it also allows for more importing and imp uh, exporting. Um, and that's going to also create more of a global economy. So look, there are even a few more that I decided to add. Just that, and we could keep going, but th those are the kind of key things um, that that really impacted it with this new technology. And the new technology was spurred on because of the factories and the growth of the factories. People were looking to improve product, the machines, transportation. Um, and so it really was a direct cause and effect of because of the increase in factories and the development, you had to push for new technology because the new technology, it increased and improved the factories along with these, these other components. Now in the United States, um, the, um, there we go, the Industrial revolution or market revolution, as the first one is often called, comes around the 1830s, right? So again, you have early 1800s where these things are starting to really fully develop. Well, then 1790s or so in England to the 1800s, it's really um, uh, shifting. And the United States comes in following that in the 1830s. Berlin, uh, France, uh, continental Europe uh, also came in uh, 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 just a little bit before and after the United States as well. So again, England was at that epicenter of that early start of factories and then the others develop uh, uh, and then it spreads from there to colonial uh, uh, areas as England and others begin to industrialize their colonies. Um, and with through imperialism. So imperialism, which we're going to be looking at more uh, next time, uh, is going to play a direct role in the development of other uh, societies industrializing as well, sometimes wanted, sometimes not. Um, but but it, it is something that continues to spread um, uh, as people look to change uh, the economy, business opportunities, and it fundamentally changes societies who uh, industrialize. So the United States, you have uh, the first factories were the Lowell Mills. And they were the Lowell Mills because the, the, the owner was Francis Lowell. You actually have the first uh, example of uh, what corporate, corporate espionage. He went to England to tour the factories and totally stole their factory plans. And then came back to the US and was like, okay guys, I came up with this totally awesome idea, I swear, by myself and uh, built the factories based on the factory specs and blueprints that he stole from England. Um, so yeah, the United States got their factories from theft, essentially. Um, the, the Lowell Mills were textile factories as well. Almost everywhere when you have the early development of factories, it ends up uh, starting with um, uh, textile-based systems. Uh, he initially looked for um, workers, uh, just much like England did. Um, he looked to young men, uh, specifically of a middling farming class. Uh, and they were not interested. Right, and they were not interested, again, in similar reasons because it was seen as women's work. And there was still, while the, the farming was struggling, there was still a desire to uh, hold on to that. And so by, you know, uh, moving away from that, uh, it would signify that you know that was that dream wasn't going to happen, and then of course negative reputation of England's factories, and so everyone's kind of like, uh, no thanks, you know, whole satanic pit, hell pit, that doesn't sound fantastic. I think I'll pass. So he was kind of like, well, what do I do? Because now I don't have workers, but the whole taking orphans is a big no-no now, 
Um, and Francis Lowell specifically was looking to change the reputation of the factories from what had been in England. So even if it wasn't a, you know, a big no-no in society to take orphan children and force them into labor, um, that would be the opposite of what his goal was to just recreate what England did wrong. And I mean, the world was aware of the whole forced child labor thing. So instead he looked to the young uh, daughters of the farmers. Because the, the thing was, right, is that these, these farmers in this middling group were still struggling. And so he said basically like, look, you know, you could use the help of having another family member who normally isn't providing an income be able to help out. But he had to convince them because again, uh, negative uh, view. And now you're saying send your daughter. The problems that uh, were with this, of course, where it looked at England's reputation, but also the fact that the girls would have to live um, at the factory and and this was because that the factory towns were uh, not close to um, regular towns at this early stage now with the continued advent of railroads that will change but at the time when he started so now you're saying okay we've got this negative reputation and, and specifically in England with women and being abused. And you're saying you want my daughter to live there unsupervised? Yeah, that seems like a bad idea. So he ended up creating this Lowell ideal. And the Lowell ideal had um, uh, three components. The first was that it would be clean and safe. The second is that it would protect women's virtue and then it but it still could make a profit right which of course was important um otherwise it wouldn't be much of a business model if you didn't ever make a, a profit and so he structured and set up the factory based on the low ideals um and meant to initially uh, protect the women and, prov and, and again, highlight those. So early low factories were actually not bad. Um, it provided women an opportunity that, uh, and women, young girls. So they were, um, the age of the girls, the structure here, um, the age of the girls was usually 14 to, uh, 21 years old right, because um, they had to be unmarried. So you did have some younger teens to uh, older teens. Um, but these were girls that, right, had never been outside of the family home. That was almost expected that you, um, you stayed with your father under your father's authority, and then you got married and you moved to your husband's home under his authority. Um, and, and there wasn't that sense of independence. And these early wool factories did provide women with independence and did provide a clean and safe place uh, that mostly protected them. Now, it's not going to stay that way, but it does start out that way. So he did attempt to follow the low ideal. So how the structure worked is that it still was long hours. You weren't getting out of that. You worked uh, uh, 10 to 14 hours, depending, although initially the work was pretty slow. There's descriptions of it... Um, where um, they, they would only work, uh, it'd be 30 minutes on and off. So you had 30 minutes downtime where you could uh, read, talk with the other girls. Basically all the rules that the Berlin factory and what we've been talking about in England did not apply here. They were free to chat. They could, they could go after they'd uh, changed. The girls initially what they were doing is you'd change the spindle. So you'd put a spindle in and then the machine was, uh, you know, doing, wrapping the spindle with a thread or taking the thread to weave. And, and your job was just to replace the empty spindle each time. 
uh, and that was usually a 30 minute process with the early machines and the girls were only given one machine to take care of so you'd replace the spindle and then you had 30 minutes to wait until the next one they were allowed to bring in a book and read they could go hang out on the grass outside of the factory um, and they could chat with each other and then you know you'd replace another spindle so it wasn't super hard work initially but it's still especially with uh uh how much we you know our work hours and stuff now it seems like a lot and it still was a, a lot in that sense um it was clean um they actually had a lot of uh, plants because the idea was is that green you know was the opposite of england's factories with that idea of dark uh, hell pit kind of thing, right? Instead, you have plants and greenery uh, and keep it super clean. Um, so they weren't working in, in these dark, horrible conditions. Um, the women lived in factory dorms, essentially. And uh, food and lodging was free, which is significant because when the factory towns... Um, shift to immigrant labor and take advantage of people you will be they will be paying for food and lodging um they they uh had a requirement that the girls had to help clean and cook in rotation and this was again the idea of of course the expectation was is that eventually they're going to get married and then they won't be working anymore and so that they need to still learn that domestic ideal this also will stop being cared for when it shifts to immigrant labor but it, but this is this is the early system they were paid a uh, dollar fifty to two dollars uh, a week which again sounds awful but it wasn't horrible um, and many women wrote about the fact that they actually had their own money that they could do what they wanted with they created a bank to encourage the girls to practice savings and didn't have any charges for that. Many of the girls sent money home and talked about how they felt like it was they, it was helpful that they were helping their family and participating. They had classes that they could take. They didn't have to, but they could. They also had the Lowell Offering, which was a magazine um, that... Um, the girls wrote articles and stories in and was published and sent around to people. Um, you did have rules. This is um, for protecting the virtue. There was rules of conduct for the girls. Um, oh, and in the factory dorms, there was about four to six girls in each room. And many uh, also... Um, didn't have a lot of friends, girlfriends outside of their family. You know, if you're living on these larger farms, it, you could go quite a long time before there was a neighbor um, and there's, you weren't going to high school and stuff. So, so it created a sense of camaraderie and friendship that they often wrote about. Again, in these early years, I can't stress enough, this is all at the early years, it changes. So the rules of conduct, um, they had a curfew. Well, lights out kind of being at home. You had to be unmarried right as was i mentioned because expectation is once you're married you, your husband and then your children were what you took care of not work um there was no courting right or dating allowed got to protect their virtue um there was a dress code um and there were behavior requirements of proper decorum they also had uh basically what was a, a house mother a woman, an older woman that was hired to live in the dorms and help not over, not only oversee like the cooking and cleaning, but make sure that the women were protected uh, as well as probably behaving. Uh, and then they also had a hospital uh, for if the girls got sick um, that they could go um, and be taken care of. Now this, so th this was the early Lowell system. Uh, and let's see, we look, I didn't show the steam powered engines here. So let's look at those. Here's one of the earlier designs. Um, and there were limitations on, on how many, uh, uh, carts, uh, could be pulled. 
Um, so it was a huge jump when you have the more modern design where you could have 12 to 14 cars and several passenger cars. This is a, it looks like a, one of the passenger cars. Um, so that the trains became not just transporting of goods and lots of goods, but also transporting of people. This, and then the next one is the early um, Lowell Mills. Uh, here was the, uh, uh, the different factories and the dorms. And then you have the Lowell Offering. This is the cover of the magazine that the Lowell uh, um, Offering, this, this or what the Lowell um, Factory, that's the word there, uh, created. One of the things that I think is, is significant with this is if you notice all of the green and nature. This was intentional. It always reminds me of it, um, one of the, the books I had um, uh, growing up was The Secret Garden. And the cover of that book looked a lot like this. It reminds me of that, of all of this nature and garden and greenery and fruit, right? And she's walking with a book and it looks like a, a bag or picnic basket right? Just kind of on a daily stroll. The factory is in the background here, but it's not the center of it. And this, this was again, a very intentional, uh, somewhat propaganda, um, but also it reflected, uh, the Lowell ideal that he was trying to showcase of that, you know, we can be different than England. It doesn't have to follow that, uh, same structure. Uh, okay, so the Lowell Mills, how, why it changes, uh, the market, <laughs> the, um, market, um, was, uh, a series of, of panics, um, during this time, uh, and part of that had to do with the fact that, um, uh, you know, it was new and there weren't a lot of rules and restrictions and protections with that. And so really, if you look at like the panics of the mid 1800s to the 1860s, it's a constant series of ups and downs. Things are going great. Yay. And then, oh my gosh, it's tanking. There are so there and they're titled panic of blah, blah, blah. There, there's a lot of them. And, uh, this along with, um, so we could say the, the market and there's my dog whining in the background again. Uh, the labor market and the panics that this causes the price of cotton to go down. And the problem with that, of course, is that impacts sales. So they start actually um, uh, uh, cutting hours and wages of the girls from what we were just talking about. So because of the um uh increase in hours actually they also increased the number of machines that the girls had to do so before where you again it was one and then you waited a half hour and then you put another one in and you had this kind of slower paced work they kept adding more machines so that you were running from machine into machine to machine and all of a sudden you know 10 hours of work becomes a whole lot more work and then your pay gets cut on top of that and then they increased the hours well the issue was right these girls came from this middling farming community they had the ability to go home this was extra that helped the family but it wasn't um, you know life or death like I need this in order to survive um, and so some girls just, just they did actually protest they did try to get some changes but many ended up leaving either because they were old, they got old enough to where they did got married and others that they just decided it wasn't worth it anymore and they left a few stayed on after but uh, most who are the original little girls did not as it began to shift and so the whole little ideal um, got phased out especially when it was like, well, immigrant labor now, we don't have to follow that anymore. This then shifted in many ways, much like with what was going on in England. So you get these, what are called factory towns. Technically, the early little mills were factory towns, but they didn't function the way factory towns came to be. Uh, it was often family units with the immigrant labor. Um, and then they could also, uh, cheaper wages now all of the sudden um, uh, you paid for everything 
this is where the factory towns become exploitive. Uh, room, you paid rent. There was a store for food. And this was especially uh, taking advantage of people because what they do is that you could buy on credit. This was the factory owned all of this. So uh, they were getting the rent that was being paid, the money bought at the stores. That was all money that went back to the factory. So basically the, the families got their wages and then those wages went right back to the factory. Um, they they were, would take it on credit, but it was higher prices. But because uh, of the long work hours uh, and, and an and inability to get into town to buy at cheaper stores, plus the stores in town didn't take credit and many families didn't have enough money till payday, they had to buy at the more expensive factory-owned store. Um, so it was a system that continued to, to exploit. Uh, you get poor conditions. Right, the whole clean and safe goes out the window. Many people had to, rent, families had to rent rooms or really rent a, a part of a room to any single men because they couldn't afford a whole place on their own. So you had uh, homes, these rooms that, or uh, you know, apartments really that were crowded with people because they were desperately trying to survive. Um, all of those are the benefits of, of classes. They did have an elementary school for the children, um, but older children would often work and help the families and factories like that because they could pay women less than men and children less than women. Um, and so this shifts into, like I said, the, then what becomes the traditional factory labor, largely with immigrant labor in the U.S. and uh, reflected much uh, more towards what England had done. Now, not as extreme again with orphans and um, the uh, um, abuse, but harsh conditions, um, uh, a lot of restrictions, penalties for things, much like um, this is where we see the uh, similar to the Berlin, um, uh, what we saw here with the Berlin factory and the rules uh, uh, within that uh, reading, um, that that's kind of what this becomes. So that that's a good example if you're looking at okay, what was the immigrant uh, when it shifts to immigrant labor? What were the factory towns like uh, and the factory work and structure in the U.S.? Well, very very similar to what those laws and rules were for Berlin. Um, and that makes sense because they were developing around the same time. Um, this, the last thing I want to look at, um, as I know uh, timing wise, we're getting a little long for this, um, is that um, there's a, a huge change um, that takes place um, with um, the new middle class. There wasn't a full middle class before, um, and th this was this was in this was in Europe. Um, this develops in in the U.S. as well. There wasn't a, a, a concrete middle class before the development of factories and industrialization. You had a middling group. It was the nobility or wealthy in the U.S. where there isn't nobility, the poor, and then everyone else in between. Uh, the development and structure of, of uh, factories creates a, a concrete middle class uh, with the characteristics of that they have enough wealth for, um, uh, to be able to buy stuff comfortably, right? And, and there's this kind of goal to imitate the wealthy. Now, they can't afford... Um, uh, stuff like, um, you know, ex imports from Paris, uh, if you're in the U.S., or, or from the United States, if you're in Europe and stuff like that, but replicas and things like that, and, and, and the, the uh, leisure and freedom for purchasing. Uh, this is also going to specifically go to having enough wealth that women uh, don't have to work. And this is going to create a whole new industry with this wealth on um, shopping and advertisements. Um, because now people are buying uh, because they want to, not because of the need. 
Um, and so you actually get the early um, department store um, as women were the ones buying for the home. Sears and Roebuck uh, was one of the earliest. And the idea was is that women could go and spend time shopping for fun uh, as well as whatever they wanted for the house, right? These are like the early shopping malls, essentially. You also have mail order catalogs that uh, come out of this where you can uh, write shop from home and order something and have it delivered to your house, early Amazon. <laughs> And, and the, this was revolutionary in the sense of, right, you could look at designs, you could look at anything you wanted in these catalogs that got sent to your house and, and order it. And it was largely targeted towards women um, because women were the new uh, household managers. Um, one of the consequences for women's roles, though, uh, was that many felt that they lost um, a sense of status, uh, and this is going to create the cult of domesticity. So status in anywhere in the world is based on the value um, that it has. Uh, and and um, in past, the value was production before industrialization. It was production through agriculture. And uh, now women weren't super high on this, but they were still part of, and so the more that you produce through agriculture and production, the higher your status. If you go back to hunting and gathering, it was just production for survival, which is why women and men were actually equal in status. Um, but then after industrialization, it was money. And your status then was based on the value. So the value was money. So your status was either up or down based on whether you produced money. But why women had a slightly higher status with production through agriculture is because they were, their work was visible. Um, they, what they did in the home uh, was more seen because their husbands were home working in the house and the farm. When you move to industrialization, this takes a shift to work outside of the home. And um, this then creates a sense of invisible uh, labor, right? All the work that women are doing within the household. And then the fact that <clears throat> with the middle class, it's that they're, you know, they're supposed to stay at, at home and not work. Um, then their value is seen as minimal um, and, and that status then is low. So women intentionally create the cult of domesticity to try to increase that uh, status in society. So in order to combat this, uh, like I said, creating the cult of domesticity, um, this was intentionally done. It was put into magazines, uh, into newspapers, into books to try to increase the value of what they did. Um, so with the cult of domesticity, and this was mostly for uh, Western uh, societies, um, because you had a different kind of idea within um, Asian societies, and Africa was also different and not industrializing at this point in time. So we're looking at uh, continental Europe and the United States where you see this shift of cult of domesticity. Um, the first was uh, uh, the role, well, what they called, they called the cult of domesticity uh, the noble profession. And that was intentional, right? This idea of, of noble, that's something of value, importance, and profession is kind of the same thing, right? If you just say it's my job. It's like, well, that's what you do for work. But if it's a profession, it seems like something that's better or, or more valuable or, or something that's long term in that sense. So at the top of the list was motherhood, raising the children. The second one was um, 
this idea of, of um, the home as a haven, that they were so, supposed to create this protective uh, space in the home. Uh, and this had to do with this idea that, uh, that many saw that industrialization had created a dangerous world. It was all about individualization and competition. And so the home could be this safe place of protection. They also were the um, economic manager, right? Because they were the ones that purchased stuff. Um, they were supposed to uh, make sure that the e economics of the home was stable because again remember there were a lot of panics there was a lot of up and downs and then they were the moral center um, and so that was of course that religious connection within the family the moral center of the family so these were their main roles within the cult of domesticity this is important later especially within the u.s of that it opened up additional roles for women it, this is really centered within the home right and it was just meant to be this idea of look this is what we do this is our profession as a, a, a mother who stays at home like we are doing stuff and it's valuable things um, and it, like I said, it got promoted actively and, and really stays until the 1950s in the United States. Um, but this, I, uh, it, it was in Europe as well. Um, but in the U.S., it also spread to alternatives of things outside of the home. Um, many women um, uh, ended up becoming authors for the economic manager. Um, you have novels, specifically the uh, romance genre emerges um, after industrialization largely by women it was a way to make money but from home because of course the idea was you weren't supposed to go out and work um, the moral center women were largely responsible for the second great awakening in the u.s um, because they were basically groupies <laughs> they went around and followed the traveling preachers and promoted it but that was connected definitely to their sense of that we're supposed to be creating this moral center to um, uh, uh, keep our homes safe. Uh, they continued to push the drunkard's progress, uh, which was this idea that drinking was evil that eventually leads to changes with prohibition. Um, home is the haven in the heartless world. This was also, um, oh, well, mother, let's do motherhood first. This led to many women uh, uh, getting careers in social work outside of the home with college degrees and things that developed because social work was an easy quick back connection to motherhood motherhood you took care of people you looked out for you know those who couldn't take care of themselves social work was helping out with the poor and those who needed help it was seen as a, an acceptable connection and then home as the haven you actually have eventually a move towards politics and voting many women argued uh, in the u.s uh, that um, they couldn't create a home as a haven and protect the home if they didn't have the ability to change certain political stuff. And there was a lot of resistance for women getting the right to vote, saying it was you know, a male-dominated thing, it wasn't for women. And they um, utilized as one method of trying to gain the right to vote, saying, don't worry, we're just going to vote on women's issues that are connected to you know, our noble profession. Of course, that's not what happened. But it, it was effective because many people then could say, oh, okay, I can see how this connects back to the domestic sphere. Because all of this was this idea of, again, women and the domestic sphere, which we saw as an issue with the textile factories as well and all of that. So again, cult of domesticity was a significant change in, in, in um, uh, identifying women's specific roles within the home in the middle class. Um, and, and this was both in the U.S. and Europe, and it does lead to uh, later opportunities outside of the home as time goes on within those, those areas, um, as well as the middle class, like I said, uh, creating a whole new system of advertising, shopping, um, and uh, consumption because of that increase in wealth in the middle class that didn't exist before. All right, I apologize that this one was so long. I did not intend it to be. Lots to talk about with industrialization. Industrialization is such an important shift within the world and we'll see how it connects to imperialism and other, um, as the scramble for Africa um, and changes up to World War I that directly relied on industrialization and, and changes in technology. 
Um, so that's where we'll end. Uh, we'll be looking at an imperial.